getting started. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Toronto Centre RASC Recreational Astronomy Night Meeting for uh, February. Uh, my name is Paul Markov. I'll be your host for this evening. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like uh, to thank uh, Chris Vaughn for hosting the meeting last month as I was un unable to make it. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> and uh, tonight we have a great uh, uh, lineup uh, uh, for you of speakers. We have uh, Andy Beaton. He'll present the sky this month, uh, followed by Blake Nancaro. Uh, He's, his presentation is uh, called Double Stars, Unnoticed Treasures. Uh, and then we have Adrian Aberdeen, um, Balcony Astro Imaging, Reaching New Heights. So um, before I get started, I wanted to see by a show of hands, do we have somebody who's here for the first time, uh, new members or not new members? Okay. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we always like to keep track of any, any new uh, people here. Uh, and uh, for our speakers, uh, please keep the acronyms down to minimum. If you must use acronyms, please explain what they mean so we can all follow along. And uh, let's see. What we're going to do is after Andy, we're actually going to have Adrian go second place and then followed by, uh, uh, by Blake just to, to keep it straight. And uh, I think without further ado, we're ready to get started with uh, Andy Beaton, the sky this month. Okay, can uh, you getting my voice here? All right, how about now? Okay, uh, sky this month, uh, starting now till the next meeting, uh, March 21st. I'm a good deal happier this month than I was last month because I've actually seen some sky, so I feel like I'm an astronomer again. What we have coming up tonight, uh, the big picture, uh, planets, the moon, galaxies, comets and meteors, a variable star because I love variable stars, and whatever's going on in spaceflight this month. Starting off with the big picture, um, around uh, early dark, we've got uh, all the usual uh, winter constellations, so we still have our nice view of uh, Taurus and Orion, the Orion Nebula, Gemini, uh, all the good winter stuff still there to see. Unfortunately, not much in the way of uh, planets yet. Getting up in the morning, that's a different thing. Uh, We've got our uh, spring and uh, early summer constellations by then. Uh, we also have a, a nice string of planets showing up here. We've got uh, Jupiter, we've got Mars, we've got Saturn, Pluto, yeah, sort of. We've got uh, Haumea and Makemake, if you've got a huge telescope, or you just want to have a look at the area where they are. Uh, I don't know anybody here who has a telescope capable of seeing them, but... Uh, you never know, you know, people go on trips to see uh, big telescopes down in the States and you can always put it on the list of things to see. The nights are getting shorter, we're coming up on the uh, equinox. Uh, tonight, uh, twilight ends at, uh, or, yeah, twilight ends at 7.12, that's when we uh, get our good observing starting. And it starts again at 5.16 in the morning. By next meeting, it'll be uh, 7.43 by the time it gets dark, and uh, 4.24 when it starts getting light again. So your, your all-night observing sessions are going to get shorter and shorter. Important dates coming up in the next month. Uh, the new moon on March 17th. We've got uh, daylight savings time starting on March 11th. If you're the kind of person who records all your observations in universal time, you'll be uh, adding on four hours instead of five hours to your, uh, to your observing logs. The spring equinox on March 20th. If, you be, if you're the kind of person who's going to be traveling out east, or you're the kind of person who likes watching astronomical events on the internet, uh, the moon will be occulting uh, Aldebaran. Um, not really visible around here, but it is visible in some parts of Canada and uh, most of Europe, I believe. 
If you uh, check your observer's handbook, which I'm sure everybody does, it'll tell you that uh, for the first uh, two weeks after uh, uh, the beginning of the new month, uh, the zodiacal light will be visible in the uh, western sky after uh, twilight. Uh, for those who haven't seen uh, zodiacal light, it's uh, dust in the plane of the solar system being illuminated by the sun. It's a difficult thing to see. I've seen it twice in my life, and that's after an awful lot of observing. But it's pretty cool when you do see it. Uh, coming up this month for the moon, we've got the first quarter in uh, two days, full moon on March 2nd. Uh, last quarter on the 9th, and the new moon on the 17th coming up. Uh, for people who are keen on trying to find the lunar X, it's uh, the next uh, chance to do that will be uh, tomorrow night, actually tomorrow afternoon at uh, 1.07 in the afternoon. Assuming it's clear, you should be able to see it with any telescope, uh, any decent sized telescope. Um, the moon's pretty visible during the daytime. For those who haven't seen the Lunar X before, I actually dug up a picture of it this time. Whoops, here, I'm not too far, here we go. And if you take a look right here, when you get that uh, certain angle of light at the right time, you get an X formed out of the, uh, the rims of a few craters there. It's a, it's a cool thing to see. It's a you know, fun thing to, uh, to show people if you want to impress them with your uh, your astronomical knowledge. You know, seeing it won't really gain you any, uh, any certificates or anything, but it's cool to see it. Uh, while I'm discussing the moon, I should also uh, say that it's still a good time to uh, work on your, uh, your lunar uh, Explore the Universe certificate. Um, it's, a, it's still kind of chilly out at night. It's still a good time if you want to uh, Go out for a quick observing session with your binoculars, look at the moon, and head back in again. Planets coming up. Um, Mercury and Venus are finally going to appear in the western sky uh, once we get uh, closer to the next meeting. On March 15th, it'll be at its greatest elongation. That's the highest point in the sky we're going to see it for the next few months. It'll be reasonably close to Venus throughout the month, and that's going to help to spot it because it's pretty faint. It's only there in the twilight. It's uh, not a trivial observation, but it can be seen. Um, Venus is uh, making a good appearance. It's coming back to the evening sky, and it's going to be uh, more and more prominent throughout the summer. So this is your chance to, uh, to start observing it anyway. Uh, March 5th and 18th, there will be conjunctions between uh, Venus and Mercury. So if you are going to try and find Mercury, that will be a good uh, guidepost to try and find it. The morning planets, for those of us willing to wake up early, uh, you, we get our, uh, once again, parade of uh, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn. Uh, last month, uh, Mars was uh, Jupiter's companion. Uh, this month it's heading over towards Saturn. Um, there is a lot of uh, noise going on on the internet about how this is going to be one of the best uh, years in a long time to see Mars. Um, it will probably be the largest uh, in apparent diameter it's been since uh, 2003. So if you have uh, an observing project ahead of you to uh, measure Mars as it approaches and, uh, and moves away again, it's a good time to start. Uh, the moon will be beside uh, Jupiter on the 7th and Saturn on the 10th and, 10th and the 11th, both, reas uh, both reasonably close passes. So if you're looking for uh, scenic photographs, uh, that would be a good time to take them. Uh, sadly, uh, none of them are going to rise very high from our point of view here. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, amazing detailed ast uh, astrophotographs, you know, amazing views of the clouds of Jupiter, uh, this might not be a good time for you. Now, something that was going around on the internet yesterday, I got an email saying that uh, the Great Red Spot was disappearing for the first time in recorded history. Um, 
I don't know whether it's really going to happen or not. The source I got was Newsweek, which I don't consider to be a, a reputable astronomical journal. <laughs> but they got the information from somewhere, and it's definitely worth watching for. Um, the last time I saw the great red spot, it was kind of the great salmon pink spot. And I understand it's uh, getting paler and smaller as time goes on. Whether it's really going to disappear or not, I don't know. But uh, if you're looking for an observing project, uh, try seeing the great red spot before it disappears, or try recording uh, observations of it as it comes back. The other planets, uh, Neptune, Uranus, Pluto, and Ceres. Uh, Uranus is in Pisces, getting very close to the sun. Um, you'll be able to see it, but it's getting more and more, uh, more, more and more deep into twilight. Uh, you're going to have a hard time seeing any kind of details. That you're going to have a hard time seeing the moons, but it's still visible. Uh, Neptune's in conjunction behind the sun on March 4th, so we're not going to see any Neptune for the next month. If you're up early in the morning, right before twilight, uh, Pluto will be appearing over the horizon. If you have a good low eastern horizon and it's a really clear night and you're looking over a lake or something and not over a city, uh, you might have a chance to see it. Um, it is very close to the Milky Way, so you're going to have a hard time spotting it in a single viewing. It's going to be a very faint dot among a million faint dots. The best way would probably be take a photograph and compare it to a map or Try and make a really accurate drawing and go back in a week and see if anything has moved. Uh, Ceres, my favorite minor planet, is uh, just about directly overhead uh, in the evening now. Um, just under 8th magnitude. Uh, should be easy to spot with binoculars if you have any kind of decent map. And it's moving pretty quickly, about uh, 10 arc minutes a day, so if you have uh, interest in tracking an asteroid as some kind of science project, then uh, it's a, a good target for it. Uh, we're getting away from uh, the Milky Way. We don't have the overhead Milky Way from uh, in Cygnus in the summer. We don't have uh, the Orion Milky Way in the winter. So we're kind of looking out of the Milky Way and seeing into the depths. So there's a lot of good galaxies this time of year. We've got uh, big clusters in Virgo and uh, and Canis Betatisi. We've got uh, prominent, uh, obvious, uh, bright galaxies, M81 and 82 in Ursa Major, M87 in Virgo, uh, 65 and 66 in Leo, 51 in Canis Betatisi. Um, they aren't really great urban targets. They're kind of too diffuse for that. But if you're out under dark skies anywhere, they're bright, prominent galaxies with a reasonable telescope. You can see all kinds of structure in them, so they're worth looking for. Now, my favorite spring deep sky object, which is always worth looking for, is uh, Markarian's chain. The long chain of galaxies in Virgo. Um, as we get into the late evening around now, it's going to be just about uh, directly overhead to the south a bit. Um, this is it here. We've got a whole string of uh, galaxies coming along here, M84, M86, the eyes. And a whole bunch of other uh, Messier objects all in the neighborhood. A uh, decent wide-field telescope will get them all in the same field of view. Uh, it's really the best time of the year to look for it. Um, if you're doing your Messier uh, list, you're going to get a whole bunch of objects all at once. So I would advise, you know, especially uh, beginning observers who haven't uh, seen a lot of galaxies, uh, get out there with a pair of binoculars or a telescope and have a look. Um, if you have kids or uh, you're showing the telescope to kids. Uh, these guys here make a smiley face that uh, children find amusing, and I do too when I'm drunk. A question I am often asked when I'm uh, out with my telescope is how far you can see. 
you know, people are used to the idea they can see the moon. It's a few hundred thousand miles away. And, you know, planets that are you know, many millions of miles away, but they don't really grasp that uh, there's no upper limit to how far you can see. Um, M109, roughly 83 million light years away. That's a pretty common answer for most of us. Anybody who's done the Messier list, you know, it's a bright galaxy, it's pretty far away. That's a good round number. Um, but I'm assuming that uh, being uh, keen and dedicated observers as we all are, we would like to see something better. So this is actually a really good time of the year to look for 3C273. Um, this is the uh, closest quasar to the, to the Milky Way. It's about uh, just over two and a half, uh, 2.4 billion light years away. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at uh, Markarian's chain, uh, M61, which we uh, mentioned is right below it, and a bit further below that we have 3C273. It's uh, not only the closest quasar, it's the brightest one, uh, usually between 12 and 13 and a half magnitude. Um, 12 and a half to 12.9 is normal. It looks like a star, which means it's uh, really good at getting through uh, light pollution. If you check your observer's handbook, it will tell you that uh, something that bright you can see with a four inch telescope. Um, but really, I would say a six or eight inch telescope is a more realistic number. Um, I've seen it with an eight inch telescope. I live three blocks from Honest Ed's, or where Honest Ed's used to be, which gives you a rough idea of just how bad the light pollution is where I do my observing. But I am able to see uh, the object without too much difficulty. Now, the extra cool thing about 3C273 is its brightness is variable. And if you're interested in contributing to uh, science, um, measuring its brightness and sending the uh, observations into the AAVSO, that's the American Association of Variable Star Observers. See, I'm doing my acronyms. Uh, they will make good use of that information. So I don't think we have any uh, meteor showers coming up this month of any, uh, any interest whatsoever. There's a weak uh, gamma normids if you're going to be in the southern hemisphere any time all month. But uh, even that's a really lousy one. Uh, we've got a couple faintish comets, uh, both of them discovered by pan stars overhead uh, for the next month. Um, N6 in uh, Ursa Major. Um, it's growing brighter, it'll peak around 11.3 in uh, late April. And M1, currently in Aquila, uh, peaking on June 28th at 9.3. That one will probably be the more interesting of the two comets. It might even get bright enough to have a tail. Um, the other, it's interesting if you like looking for comets. And comets are interesting, but you're not going to get a spectacular Halley's Comet kind of view out of it. Now, I do love variable stars, so everybody gets a variable star every month. Uh, this, this month, it's uh, S.Y. Cancri. Um, like the other uh, ones I'd like to recommend, it's a cataclysmic variable star. What you, that means is you've got uh, two stars orbiting around each other. One is a white dwarf, one's a giant. The white dwarf is uh, slurping material off through its uh, stronger gravitational field as the uh, gas spirals into it. It ignites and uh, you get uh, flares of brightness. Currently it's around 12.8 uh, magnitude. Um, so you probably want uh, an eight inch telescope or something better if you want to get uh, good observations of it, especially when it's uh, down at its dimmest. Um, around now it's uh, just about directly overhead around 11 p.m. And like always, I urge people to do some variable star observing. It's uh, fun and scientifically useful. And once you get into the habit, it's a good way to drag yourself out and do some observing on those nights when you think, maybe I'll just watch TV.
space flight highlights coming up. Uh, we have a couple of uh, flight proven Falcon launches, three of them. Um, I'm almost reluctant to call this news at this point. These things are so successful and so frequent that uh, uh, it's getting to be like telling people that uh, you know, a Boeing 777 is taking off from uh, Pearson. March 21st, we have uh, Expedition 55 launching to the ISS. That's coming out of the Soviet, or out of Russia. Sorry, you can tell I'm old. Uh, from now to uh, March 21st, we have uh, morning ISS passes. Um, Heavensabove.com is the uh, place to go. Um, I don't know how many people are going to uh, want to drag their kids out to see the space station at 6 in the morning, but if you're up and about for any reason at that time, it's always fun to see it. And uh, news is going around that uh, the U.S. is uh, planning to wants to cancel the budget for the W first telescope. That's the successor to the uh, Hubble telescope in visual light. Um, we'll see what happens there. Um, the last uh, uh, space flight highlight, um, and I'm going to, I should point out that I am not a, a paid employee of the producers of Sky Safari, but this is uh, something I took a picture of off my phone. Uh, Sky Safari has a uh, orbital elements for Starman in his Tesla Roadster. So you can uh, check its location. Um, I have seen pictures of, uh, that people have taken of, uh, of the uh, Tesla floating through space. I'm not sure it's visible to us at this point, but it's out there. Um, you can at least have a look at the general neighborhood and uh, hum yourself a David Bowie song and, uh, and imagine what it's like. And that's what we have. Thanks very much. And any questions? Um, someone's got the microphone, or I guess you could just shout it out and I can repeat it. <laughs> Uh, Andy, if you update here's your another, uh, event if here you to... update your Sky Safari for for iOS to the latest version, mm -hmm. and you orbit the Tesla, you get a little 3D red roadster rotating in space. All right. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, Andy, yes. there's one other uh, event here worth noting. It says here in the Mar March April issue of Sky News that on Tuesday, March 1st, the full moon or near full moon will nearly occult Regulus. From oh, okay. from here, it's only five arc minutes above. So okay. that should be a good uh, opportunity for some photos, probably. Definitely. And if people are, walk, are traveling, uh, keep an eye on the Regulus and the moon up that night. You might see an occultation. Yes. Just to add a little bit to the uh, morning planets, I was out early in the morning on last weekend, and Mars is just about the same brightness as Antares. In fact, considering they weren't quite at the same height above, I would have had a heck of a time telling the difference apart. So it's kind of neat to look at and okay. why Antares is called the opposite of uh, Mars. Right. Okay, that sounds like a good photo opportunity as well. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. And Andy is going to hand off the uh, microphone to our next speaker. Uh, Adrian Aberdeen will talk to us about uh, balcony astroimaging reaching new heights. And Adrian is a first time speaker, so welcome. Hopefully uh, we'll see you again. <laughs> He's busy with the uh, microphone. Hang on a sec. All right, all set. Go ahead.
Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Aberdeen, and the topic, uh, my title of my topic is Balcony Astro Imaging Reaching New Heights. Now, a little bit about myself before I start. Um, I grew up in a small country in the Caribbean called Grenada. Uh, it's about 100,000 people at the time when I was there. I spent half my life there. Uh, and actually, this, give me a moment. this house right here is a house that my brother and my mom and, my, and myself grew up in. So I remember getting up in the morning and the sun would be on one side of our house and then at, in the evenings, the sun would be on the other side of the house. That's how small Grenada is. And I remember at night, we would look out and see the stars. And at that time, I, I was a kid, so I didn't really know exactly what everything was. was. Um, but I always had an, an, an intriguing uh, view into uh, what stars were since I was a kid. Uh, and I don't mean to make you guys feel a little bit uh, under the weather, but this is the view that we normally have every night uh, when the sun is going down. Uh, I snapped these two pictures actually um, two years ago when uh, my brother and I went, um, my dad passed away uh, and uh, we went back for the funeral. And uh, while we were there, I snapped these pictures. But growing up, um, I would imagine this, the, uh, the Milky Way uh, across the, uh, the ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and possibly I don't remember, but this probably is what it looked like. Um, and as I grew up, I kind of got, got into trying to figure out what stars were about, what the universe was about, what life was about. Uh, and it drew me into easily into astronomy. Uh, and so two years ago, I decided, almost two years ago, really, I decided I'm going to look into buying a telescope. And the first thing that my wife said was, where are you going to put it? <laughs> and I said, the balcony. Why not, right? <laughs> So <laughs> this is my balcony. Uh, it is 16, by, 16 feet by four and a half feet. I measured it. Uh, the entire thing is not actually usable. So uh, right in the corner, uh, right here is a door. Uh, so pretty much I have uh, this much to use. And these little markings here are actually where I put my tripod uh, to try to remember exactly where everything is every time. Um, this is the view looking out. Uh, so this is, I'm on the second floor of my, uh, my, my balcony, of my building. And uh, this is facing west. Um, that's facing the south. And there is facing the north. Uh, so I actually can see Polaris from where I am, uh, which is one of the, the first things that anyone who gets into astrophotography knows. You need to be able to see Polaris to get your polar alignment in, in the place. Uh, so I had to figure out something. Uh, and the way I figured it out was pretty much over a trial and error uh, when I bought my, my rig uh, over a few months, actually. It took me to really figure out exactly what I was doing and, uh, and how to do it. And uh, so that led me, oh, this here, this is my view at night, uh, which is not that very good. I, can just, I could have seen Jupiter that night when I was there. Uh, I don't remember which, uh, which planet or star this was at the time, but that's Jupiter. Uh, so I do have an awesome view at night. Uh, an even better view when, uh, when it snows. This was taken two weeks ago. Um, and the PS of resistance is this. I have, this is my balcony right here. I have two giant spotlights <laughs> that are sitting right next to me as I image. Uh, and I'll get to, to some of the issues that I ran into while uh, trying to get this to work uh, later on in my presentation. So this is what it looks like. Uh, at, uh, at night, that's my son, my son Ethan. Uh, he's, uh, he just, he's about two, three and a half now. Uh, and one of the things he realized is as soon as daddy got his telescope, he wanted his own telescope. So I had no choice but to go out and buy a scope for him. So unfortunately, he broke it in two weeks, within two weeks of getting it. So it didn't last too long. But that's him trying to uh, enjoy his time out on the balcony with me. And that's me here with uh, the scope. This was last Friday I took that. Now, um, a little bit about the, the setup that I have. Uh, it is a uh, Celestron uh, CGEM mount. When anyone who doesn't know CGEM is uh, a German equatorial mount, which rotates as the sky rotates. So you don't have to worry about uh, moving the scope or anything. Everything just moves as the sky rotates around. Uh, and then I purchased also a Celestron uh, Edge 800 series, eight inch telescope uh, to go with it. And I'll get a little bit more into that later on. One of the reasons why I purchased the, um, the CGEM mount as well as the Edge 
uh, telescope is, uh, is both good for visual as well as astrophot imaging. Uh, this picture was actually taken here at the uh, Science Center last August during the eclipse. Uh, and so I had everything set up. And then later on that evening, uh, everything was set up for uh, astro imaging at night. Uh, some of the things that you require when you're doing astro imaging, uh, especially when you're doing it through an SCT, which is a Smith Cassegrain telescope, instead of a refractor, uh, is the, the focal ratio you need to bring it down. So I do have installed. Uh, a uh, focal reducer on here. Uh, this is my, um, my Z ZWO, ZWO, ASI 1600 uh, camera. Uh, this is a cooled camera uh, on here with a filter wheel. And then for auto guiding, uh, anyone who doesn't know what auto guiding is, it pretty much allows you uh, the mount to basically make adjustments as you go uh, throughout the night. So if there's any major changes or any shaking, it helps to guide you uh, as you go along and you don't have any trailing stars. So just quickly about the, uh, the CGEM mount, it's a sturdy two inch tripod with a 40 uh, pound capacity. I needed that actually because once I put everything together, uh, I actually get up to, uh, I think about 24 pounds with my entire rig. Uh, so it is quite heavy and you need a sturdy mount uh, for that. Uh, again, with the edge, uh, the one of the reasons why I bought it is actually has a very flat field. Uh, built in, so there's an additional piece of glass that's inside of it that makes the, the entire field flat uh, throughout, so you have pinpoint stars uh, all from all the way in the middle, all the way out. A little bit about the uh, camera th that I use. Again, it's a ZWO. It's a cooled camera, uh, which so it, it helps to reduce the amount of noise that's in your pictures uh, as you stack them. It has a large sensor for great resolution. Uh, a high dynamic uh, range, uh, which is really good uh, for shorter exposures. Uh, and anyone who doesn't know about this is, uh, because we live in Toronto, we have a lot of light pollution. Uh, it goes beyond saying. And the odds are you're going to see a handful of stars if you look outside the night skies every night. Uh, and so when you're doing astro imaging, uh, the, the sum of the light, the pollution soaks into your pictures. Uh, so it's better if you're in the city to use shorter exposures, therefore you get a little bit less uh, light pollution in your pictures. Uh, and this camera is great for that. And actually it's one of the most popular brand of cameras that's on the market right now. A lot of uh, professional guys, when I say, well, professional amateurs, if you will, are using this kind of uh, uh, camera. Uh, and this actually is what's called a narrow band camera. So uh, it actually is not a color camera, it's a narrow band. So it actually just, all it takes is light pictures, if you will. Uh, and then what you do is you uh, use a filter system where you switch around the filters and you get different wavelengths of light. Call me lazy. I don't care. Uh, I uh, invested a little bit um, into a, the Star Arizona uh, microcharge system, which is an autofocusing system. Uh, so what this allows me to do is um, I can sit back in the comfort of my living room while the uh, rig is outside and I can actually make adjustments when it comes to my focusing uh, instead of having to go up to the scope every time, change the focusing. As anyone who doesn't know, uh, as the temperature changes, the uh, air inside of the tube also changes as well. Uh, and then you get fluctuations. And so your stars might be pinpoints in one hour and then it might be a little bit oval in the next hour. So you do need to have it. The software program that I use to uh, uh, capture my image is called APT, uh, which is the Astrophotography Tool. Uh, it is a free tool that anyone can, can purchase. It's very easy to use, which is one of the reasons why I like it. Some other uh, photographers go in and they use uh, more expensive, more, um, more in-depth kind of uh, uh, programs. Uh, I like free, so I decided that I'm going to use this and I'll never turn back from it. As I mentioned earlier, there is a part of where you have to do the auto guiding. So what this is, is pretty much helps you uh, to uh, basically control the way the mount moves this throughout the, uh, the picture. And then, then I do have a, an auto focusing uh, controller that I use as well. So I go out on the, on the balcony, I take my pictures, and then I have to put everything together. And what I use to put everything together is a free tool. Again, I do like free. Uh, so it's a program called uh, Deep Sky Stacker. And uh, what you do is you put all of your pictures in. You put your light pictures in, which is the colors that you, that you the filter that you use. Uh, and then you put other uh, calibration pictures. Not to get into too much details, but 
That's what you pretty much do. Uh, and it gives you a full-on packet of uh, things you can do as well. Uh, a new program that I actually just recently started using is called Pix Insight. This is not free. Um, and uh, it is actually quite expensive. Um, but it is worth it. I will say this. I, I'm very happy that I purchased it. Uh, it is uh, one shop, uh, like all things that you can want to do with your pictures, you can do in there, uh, including uh, stacking the pictures, the same thing that Deep Sky Skacker can do. Uh, you can do it in here as well in uh, PixInsight. And then from there, you can go in and start making changes to your pictures, changing your curves uh, and things of that, like this. Uh, and then also putting in some uh, color in your pictures if you wish to. This is M8, the Lagoon Nebula. Recognize it? <laughs> I do. It's right there. This is also M8, the Lagoon Nebula. I took these uh, pictures back in uh, July of last year. Um, and uh, this is actually just only uh, 48 pictures uh, in H alpha, hydrogen alpha, uh, at 120 seconds each. Um, I actually had a, an epiphany over the weekend. Uh, in people, when I was, a few weeks ago, Paul Markov invited me to, to speak tonight. Uh, and I'm saying to myself, okay, what am I going to present? Like, well, how am I going to get this all together? I had some pictures that I'd done uh, in the summer and the fall. And I said, okay, well, I'll put those in there. And then uh, I'm actually in, uh, I have seven other friends of mine that are in an email group that I got invited to by uh, Jeff Booth, which is uh, here as well. Uh, and over the weekend, uh, while well, we go back and forth with things that we do in our, present, in, in our pictures, we get feedback from each other, we share pictures and things like that. Uh, and over the weekend, one of the members helped me so much that I went back and I was able to get a better picture and a better uh, image out of the data that I use uh, to basically pull out as much details as possible. Uh, this is M16, which is the Eagle Nebula, and uh, this is uh, our AKA, the Pillars of Creation. Uh, this pitch, this um, nebula was actually made uh, popular by uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, um, and this area here is a part uh, which they're called the Pillars of Creation. I took this picture back in uh, August, late, late August, early September of last year. Uh, it was actually um, a very trying time. Because I remember staying there on the balcony for hours on end, trying to get things to work. Uh, at that time, actually, we had a lot of uh, light uh, uh, air pollution in uh, over the city of Toronto because of the fires that was going on in Alberta. And so, for a good month or so, we had uh, just a white film of uh, of, uh, of smoke in the air. Uh, and unfortunately, some of it did seep into my my pictures. If you look around here. Um, but I, try, I tried my best to, uh, to image as much as possible and try to get in. This was actually my first uh, edit, back when I didn't know necessarily what I was doing. Uh, and I uploaded this to uh, the RSC website uh, forum, as well as on Cloudy Nights, which is a great, both of them are great resources uh, for feedback. Uh, and uh, if you are considering getting into uh, astrophotography, I would definitely suggest that you get on those forums uh, and help out. And based on the feedback that I got, uh, I was able to go back and redo uh, the M8, uh, sorry, the M16 uh, with Eagle Nebula. Uh, this is just about five hours of exposure time in there. I'll be honest with you, over uh, getting on the weekend, I actually tried to recreate what I did, and I couldn't. So sometimes it's better to just leave it the way it is and just move on uh, than trying to re redo what you did. <laughs> uh, and um, thanks to, uh, to the RASC uh, last November, I was asked, uh, if they can use my uh, my picture to, to put into the Scope magazine that we get every month. Um, and I said, obviously, absolutely, go ahead. Uh, this was pretty much the most frustrating uh, picture that I took, but it's also the most satisfying as well. Now, a little bit about things that can go wrong. So this is a dumbbell nebula, which a lot of people know. Um, and I took these back, I believe, in... October, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in this, uh, what I've done is I've actually done three wavelengths, wavelengths of light, uh, which is a hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur two. And what this allows me to do is, based on the program that I use, I can put in the filters, the lights, in different um, channels, light channels. 
So in this case, this is the red channel is oxygen hydrogen alpha, the blue channel is oxygen three, and the green channel is sulfur two. And then you go around and you play around a little bit more with the same, same data, nothing changes really, but you just get different results. And that's one of the great things about shooting in narrowband. Uh, it is very subjective. Whomever it is that's creating the picture is the one who's gonna make the decision exactly what it is they're gonna put in there and how it's gonna be presented. Um, and so you can, the, the floor is yours. You can decide exactly what you wanna do, how much you wanna do it. You can blow this up, you can blow it down. And when I said earlier, this is when you can know things can go wrong. If you notice a little bit about here, it's a little bit too much stretching in the pictures. So then I have to dumb this down. Also, I have spikes, and those actually spikes are actually detracting from some of the issues that are wrong with the picture as well. You can see the halos around the star. So even if something does go wrong, there are ways that you can try to fix it. And this is my latest creation. Uh, this is the uh, M42, which is the Orion Nebula, aka everyone's favorite. If anyone says that they don't know what the Orion Nebula is, then they're lying because uh, it is one of the most popular and most um, phot photographed um, images in the night sky. I took this last uh, Friday, which was uh, the first clear night that wasn't cold uh, in the last two months, if you will. Uh, and so I got out of the balcony. Uh, I had some uh, emails going back and forth with some of the guys. Uh, we were just going back and forth. And, and one of the things that uh, the, the guys helped me was uh, in knowing how to pull out the details uh, in, the, uh, in the dust lanes here. Uh, this is a trapezium, which a lot of people don't know. It's one of the hardest things to, uh, to get rid of because you have a lot of gas and then you have four stars in this area that are very bright. And so um, one of the things that the guys were able to help me out with was to be able to, to bring that down and get rid of some of the, the dust and bring out the trapezium in that area. And then you can do things like add a little bit of color in there and uh, just shows off a little bit more. So what about you? If I can do this, anyone can do this. I'll be honest with you. I had absolutely no clue what I was doing when I got into this. Um, my wife was always, what are you doing? When are you coming to bed? There are times when I went, <laughs> there are times when I went and I, I would start, because this, this, I really started in the summer of last year. There are times I, I would stay up until three o'clock in the morning. I have to get up at six o'clock or seven o'clock to get to work. Uh, and I would be dead tired on my, I could be dead on my feet, but I loved it. I just honestly just got a kick out of it, uh, getting into it. And uh, it's one of the things that, that I've been, for years I've been trying to find a hobby that I really can sink my teeth in. And I think I finally found it in, in, in doing astrophotography and, and, and getting into uh, astronomy in general as well. I sit sometimes and I listen to some of the presenters and I soak everything in because I just love this stuff. Uh, but if, if anyone is interested in getting into this, it's, it's quite easy. You don't need all the equipment that I have. Uh, you can get uh, very easily uh, get into this. Uh, I took this picture here up at the, the car ob uh, observatory up in Collingwood that we have access to. This was done on a DSLR camera uh, and a tripod. The tripod was just a normal uh, uh, tripod. The DSLR was uh, an unmodified uh, camera. Uh, and actually, during this time, um, I actually had my full rig going in the TNO, the, the Tony Horvatton Observatory, uh, which is right next to where I was standing when I took this picture. And um, everything was going, and I sat there, and I couldn't get anything to work. And I'm there and I'm frustrated because we, we took the time off to get up, up to the observatory and I'm trying to figure out what am I doing wrong. And then I took this picture and this made it all worth it because I'm like, okay, I got something to remember as opposed to it being just a total waste of time. And it really wasn't. The, 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 the opportunity of going to the car observatory, if anyone wants to go, uh, it is definitely worth uh, going up there and seeing some brighter uh, skies that we normally see from Toronto. Uh, you can see the Milky Way and everything in there. And even simpler, uh, this, is the, this is the picture that I <laughs> thanks. This is the picture that I took um, just before the, uh, the blue moon, full moon that we had uh, at the end of uh, January. And this was a fluke, a complete fluke. Uh, I came home, it was like 7, 6, 6.30. I told my wife, I'm gonna go outside for a second. I took the tripod, I took the camera. 
I went outside and I'm starting to frame everything together and I'm taking a bunch of shots, changing settings on the camera. And then I looked down and I was like, what is that? And I zoomed in and it's a plane. And I was like, wow! Like things, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy what, how things happen. I mean, we really don't, don't expect it. Uh, and then later on, a couple of days later, I went on, on, I put the picture up on uh, Cloudy Nights uh, as well as the RASC website. Uh, and later, so with some help of some guys, uh, we found out the flight path that the plane was on as well as the flight number. So those kind of things happen. And even if you don't have a tripod and you don't have a camera, you do have a camera because you can use your cell phone. Uh, this, these actually pictures are, are taken outside, actually in my office at work. Uh, I love staring outside. Uh, my friend and uh, my friend at work, uh, Penny and I, uh, we sit outside and we just look at the, the, the sunset every, almost every day. Uh, and you can just take normal, simple pictures and, and get into, uh, into astrophotography. So uh, this, the floor is yours. The sky is, is the limit, if you will. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. And I do want to say a uh, special thanks uh, to my wife for her patience uh, and my son for not getting in my way. And uh, also my sister-in-law who says she's going to kill me if I didn't mention her name, Khadija. So there. <laughs> Any questions? Hi. Uh, my astrophotography uh attempts have been frustrated by aligning the telescope and yes. getting it accurate every night. And I'm wondering how you do it when you're stuck with, uh, with no view of Polaris. Yeah, uh, that is actually the biggest challenge that I have every night that I set up. Um, most, part, most people just leave their rig up if they have an observatory. Uh, I don't have that luxury. Uh, I'm on the second floor and it's okay. I mean, I don't have to expect someone to climb over and get up my stuff, but uh, it's still uh, to the point where I actually do break everything down once I'm finished. Um, so what I do is, as you saw earlier in one of the pictures, I have uh, points on, uh, on the floor of the uh, balcony. And I align my, I put the scope and the tripod and everything I set up. And then I do a two-star align on, on, the, uh, on the sky uh, with the scope. Uh, and then I go into a setting which shows me what my uh, polar alignment error is. Uh, and if it's off, so sometimes I'm off uh, maybe three, five degrees, I've gotten pretty good at it now that I can get almost close to it. Uh, and what I do is I turn the, scope, the mount off, I undo everything, I move the scope, I put it back in, and I test again. Uh, I have my choice. This is the only option that I have. So that's what I do. And uh, most of the time, actually, I'm within half a degree of polar alignment error. So yeah, I, I, I'm pretty, I got it all done path now. So. I just have a remark. Mm -hmm. I, I just have a remark. Go ahead. <laughs> I met you for the first time. You brought your, your scope out for the first time at one of our city skies. Yes. At Bayview Village. Yes. I think this was the first time you had come out. I'm not sure you were even a member yet. I wasn't. And I think this was like 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. Or was, was that right? Yep. Just so, like so this was a man with a brand new scope 18 <laughs> months ago, and he has done this. It's just remarkable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I I will say that um, if 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 you're considering getting into this, don't be afraid to to go into the used market for stuff. If you if you're tight on budget, if you have all the money in the world, by all means, go ahead and spend as many thousands as you want to. Uh, but if if you're you have three year old kid at home, for example. Then uh, what I would suggest is there are a lot of um, uh, websites on, uh, online that you can go to uh, and find things that are used. Most astrophotographers and most astronomers in general take very good care of their stuff. Uh, and then when they do decide to let it go, they, you know you're going to pretty much get some good stuff. Um, I, the, the amount that I have actually purchased from a gentleman in Montreal, uh, he was on his way down to Hamilton one uh, Sunday uh, to buy a 16-inch Dobsonium. And uh, on his way down, he dropped it off for me, uh, used the gun. Uh, the scope that I have I bought from a gentleman out in uh, Manitoba. Uh, again, a lot of the things that I buy, uh, it's, mind you, there are things that you have to pay for. 
like brand new, but a lot of things you can buy or you can get on the used market for sure. So don't be afraid to, to look into that. And also, if uh, you need help, there are resources where you can go. I've been very blessed uh, by uh, Jeff Booth uh, to be invited into a group of guys that uh, help, help out a lot. We, we share a lot of data back and forth. Uh, it is a great thing if you want to get into this. You can easily psych yourself out um, by not, obviously not knowing what you're doing, and then you can get frustrated. And I was there. I was frustrated at times. Uh, and so it's great to, if you can find a group of people that are into this as well, that'll be able to help you out. Being set up on a balcony, have you had any issues with vibrations? Yes. My son running around the apartment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, there are times when I have to throw away a few uh, sub, okay. the, uh, exposures that I take uh, because there is some vibration. Uh, cars are going by sometimes in the parking lot. Uh, so, yeah, I do have that. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's okay. It's, it's not that too bad. I do have um, a few people who have actually commented, what are you doing? Uh, so there are, I do get that from time to time, especially the ones over on the other side of the buildings. They do ask, what are you doing? Are you praying into my window? I said, no, 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 no. If you want to take a look, by all means, you can come upstairs. But no, I'm not looking into your window. <laughs> Any more questions? We're good. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thanks again, Andrew. Thank you so much, and hopefully we'll see you back up here in a few months when you get some more photos to share with us. And our next speaker is uh, getting ready. Uh, Blake Nancaro will talk to us about Double Stars, Unnoticed Treasures. You going to do it? Go ahead. I can do it. So good evening, everyone. My name is Blake Nancaro, and I wanted to talk about um, double stars this evening. If you know me, you know that I really enjoy observing these particular targets. And um, I've noticed something. I think, it's not my imagination, that they seem to be uh, not frequently referred to. Um, so I, uh, I'm a little bit concerned that some people aren't uh, observing these or enjoying them. So I wanted to share uh, some, of, some of that this evening. Um, Andy, great presentation on the sky this month. And uh, I'll give you some credit. You did refer to a binary star. But, but in so I've noticed in some of our what's up this present uh, what's up this month presentations that there's little or no reference to uh, double double stars, and I've thought that kind of curious. Um, when in many cases there are references to variable stars um, and to asteroid occultations, which I think are pretty challenging um, to to do. Uh, the Astronomical League, um, the kind of analogous organization to the RASC, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the AL in the U.S., um, they have double star observing programs where you can get a certificate. Um, and we don't have that in Canada. Uh, there's, to be fair, there are some references to double stars in um, RASC uh, materials and programs. The, the Explore the Universe certificate, one of the first uh, certificates that people might pursue with RASC, there's some double stars on that. So that's good. I like that, that you know, we get people thinking about that pretty early in their astronomy career. And, and certainly the Observer's uh, Handbook. Um, the, this has a couple of references a couple of tables of double stars in it. So, so that's great. Um, 
but there's no certificate program. Um, again, these aren't mentioned in some talks. I looked in the journal, the, the RASC journal, and I went back 10 years, and I only found one article. And it was, it was kind of a happenstance thing. Alistair Ling was doing a, an asteroid occultation, or a lunar occultation, and he stumbled across a double star um, in that. So I, uh, I'm kind of curious about increasing awareness or heightening awareness about this. And, and partly I want to encourage you, if you don't normally consider these targets, that you might um, view them, uh, add them to your observing campaigns, view them, and maybe keep some notes about that. Uh, I wanted to clarify some terminology or wording because I think it's a little bit casual, a little bit loose. Um, uh, what, what is a double star? Um, th this image here of Albirio, um, this is what I think a lot of people have seen or think of when they consider double stars. Um, and certainly the definition of double means, you know, we all know means twin or a pair of things. Uh, Albirio, uh, while a good example of a a uh, sort of typical double star is actually a multi-star system, and clearly the stars are unequal. They're different colors, and they're different brightnesses. But, but uh, still, that's a great example of a of a double star. Um, but I think the word double is used very casually. Um, uh, it, you'll find lists of double stars, but they have triples, and maybe the odd quadruple um, system is listed in that. And that's certainly true in some of the RASC tables um, that, that they refer to some triples. Uh, triples are pretty common, actually. Um, uh, you can get four or five companions in some, some uh, double star uh, uh, listings. Which brings up also the designation or the way that we uh, sort of classify the individual members. We simply use letters capital letters, A usually refers to the primary or the brightest star, uh, B is the secondary star, C and D, and so on. Um, if you can make it out in that image, though, if you look closely, you'll notice that the C star is super faint, where the D and the F stars are, are brighter. And there's a gap, not all the letters are used in that example image, that's the um, multi-star system Autostruve 457, and it, it's got some interesting lettering patterns in it. So there, to me, there's no rhyme or reason, uh, per se, for the lettering system. But that's the convention that we use to identify all the individual members. Adrian's photo of the Great Orion Nebula that we were looking at a few moments ago, you saw in the middle of it, he pointed out trapezium, and, and that's a multi-star system that many people have looked at. That one's sort of fun to look at at low power because uh, you'll see the four stars. We could see the four stars in your photo there very nicely. Um, but if you use higher power, you've got good observing conditions, there's six members um, that can be viewed in that system. And I've been fortunate to see that on, on some occasions. You can get extreme scenarios with multi-star systems. I took this image with the uh, Burke Gaffney Observatory um, Automated Telescope in Halifax of the 37 cluster. This is an open cluster, and it's also considered a multi-star system. It's Struve 848, and every one of those stars that make up the digit there, they're all members of this multi-star system. So in a lot of open clusters, you get double stars. Maybe a, there's a bunch of individual pairs um, in that, or all of the members in that loose open cluster are considered a multi-star system. So it, a lot of variety, a lot of different sort of arrangements of all these. My point is that you can have two, or three, or four, or five, or 15, or 20 stars in a multi-star system. And a lot of people will just call that a double star system. The term, again, is used very, very casually. And I tend to use double stars just very casually when I'm observing all of these types of objects, just because it's easier than saying, Hey, do you want to go outside and observe double stars and triples and trinaries and quadruple systems and quintuple systems and some multi-star systems tonight? Well, it's clear. It's just a bit of a mouthful to go through all of that. Um, a lot of times I'm asked at star parties if 
uh, the members of a double star or a multi-star system are I interacting, if they're related in some way, and they may be. Um, but sometimes you get this, you just get a chance alignment of two stars. So the A star in that image is in the foreground, as it were, it's relatively close to the Earth, say it's 100 light years away, and the B star is 200 light years away. You can have stars that are light years apart, maybe on uh, different sides of the galaxy, but when we look at them through a telescope or binoculars, they're perfectly lined up. So you get chance alignments there, those are referred to as optical um, double stars, um, and uh, they're, they're fun to look at, but they're not involved um, or they're not part of a system. You can get stars, though, that are very close together, like those stars in an open cluster. They might be a couple of light years apart, and they may be gravitationally interacting. We can determine that if we repeatedly look at um, the members of a multi-star system and we measure their proper motion, where they're moving through space. And if all the members, all the stars in an open cluster show the same proper motion, they're physically related. They're a system. But if stars are really close together, we're talking less than a light year, maybe astronomical units apart, um, there, there may be some interesting situations where, in fact, you get stars that orbit one another. So that's uh, officially a binary um, double star system in that case when you get a star orbiting another star. They're gravitationally bound, one orbits the other, or they orbit around a common center of gravity. Um, we can get complex systems there. You can get two binaries that orbit each other, and then the, the two pairs orbit each other. There's more and more complex arrangements that we're seeing. Um, but binary is a term that's often used to refer to two stars. And that example there that I'm showing you is a plot of the B star of Castor um, orbiting the A primary star. A neat thing about this is that some binary orbits are fast. They have short periods, maybe less than 100 years. There's some that are 50 or 60 years. So that means if you return to some of these or revisit some of these binary systems, you'll notice how they're changing over time. You'll see a change in their position or their distance from one another. So, so that's a neat thing about double stars as well, that, that some of these are dynamic. Um, uh, and that, that can actually be measured, but I'll leave that for another, another day. One of the things that, to me, is very attractive about double stars is their color. And the color is real. It's color that you can see with your eye. Don't get me wrong, I like deep sky objects, I like looking at galaxies, I like looking at far away stuff, um, but a lot of times when we look at a galaxy through the telescope, it's a faint fuzzy, it's a gray fuzzy kind of object, or maybe there's a hint of color in it, but nothing major. But you look at double stars, and they're clearly very colorful. You see that right away, and that can make for a real sort of wow factor. That's part of the reason why I encourage people to include double stars in their observing lists at star parties. It's low-hanging fruit, it's eye candy. Um, a lot of people really enjoy that. You can get some very strange color descriptions if you read some books or um, uh, observing lists. Um, you, you get some fantastic descriptions that might raise some eyebrows. Um, colors, of course, are very subjective. Um, if, if you consider the the stellar classification chart, we, we know that we can get blue-white hot stars, O-class and B-class stars, and we can go all the way down to K and M-class, and then beyond that, C-class stars that are very orangey and red. And when you get two of these right beside each other, it, it's fantastic. There's some really cool color combinations that you can get. You may know that our sun is a G-class star, so it's a, by itself it might appear white, um, but you put it beside a blue or a red star and you go, oh, that, that G-class star has a bit of a yellow cast or a lemon kind of color or something like that. So colors are fun with uh, double, double stars. An, an interesting thing to me, but it all also can be a very challenging thing about double stars, is how close or far apart they are from one another. So you know that we measure things in the celestial sphere in our night sky using angular measurement. 
we use degrees, minutes, and seconds. Uh, and, and a lot of double star lists will indicate how far away the stars are from one another, and they're usually measured in arc seconds, um, which is the, the smaller measurement. Uh, but uh, when casually observing double stars, usually my first impressions are words like wide or attractively close or very close. And in some cases, you get double stars that are so close together, given the way that you're viewing them, the equipment that you're using, if anything, um, you'll get double stars that are so close to each other that they appear to be touching. Those descriptions that I'm showing you are from a book that I'll mention a bit later, but you can see that uh, up near the top, we've got two stars so close together that they're just blending in. They look like a figure eight or a snowman. Um, uh, Adrian was talking about his photographs and how he uses his guiding um, camera to try and keep the stars pinpoint. But sometimes you'll get guiding errors in a photograph. If you are imaging um, some objects and you get a little guiding error, um, all, all your stars might be stretched. They might look rod shaped or like a figure eight. But if you see one star that's um, going in a different direction, that it's stretched in a different direction, you might have found a, a very close double, double star. I encourage people to you know, always keep log notes. I know Mr. Markov is a big fan of that. Um, so if you're uh, keeping logs um, for your observations, Consider some of that terminology, using that in your logbook to describe the, the stars. Note the colors and note how close or far away they are from another. Um, or you might refer to the, the gap between them, that they're split by hair or split by a black line. Um, and, and there's no prize or trophy at the end of this. Um, so there might be an instance where you're trying to look at a particularly... Uh, interesting double star or a highly recommended one, and you may not be able to split them. And it might be because you're using very low power or it's low on the horizon, um, or the sky is just bad. You have poor conditions. So that's okay, write that in your logbook. I could not split this pair on this date. And you can try again later. Something that can be challenging when trying to split double stars is the difference in the brightness of the individual members. That previous image that I showed you, those two stars, I made them the exact same color and brightness. But that's, that's rare that you get that. A lot of times the stars are quite different. This is an illustration, and an artist rendering of Sirius and its companion star, the white dwarf star on the right, that little bright blue pinpoint of light, um, which some people casually call the pup. So Sirius A and Sirius B are really hard to split just because the B is so dim. It may be lost in the glare. So if you get really dramatically different brightnesses um, of stars, it, it can be challenging to separate them. Uh, that's something I enjoy. That, that's one of the, the sort of challenge aspects of double star observing, is being able to see a faint companion beside a bright star. In, in general, if the stars are equal brightness, they can be extremely close together and you'll be able to split them. Um, but if they're very different magnitudes, in general, they'll have to be further apart. There's actually some formulas um, that people have developed to try and uh, sort of predict that. But that's something I'll note in my logbook again, that maybe I couldn't split them because um, they're very difficult to see beside each other. I don't know if you have an occulting eyepiece, but some people may have built or uh, purchased an occulting eyepiece that's got a bar um, in it or something like that to block part of the field. So if you do have an occulting eyepiece, which is often used for planets, you could maybe use that on a, a, a double star that's got a, a bright uh, member. Uh, did, did you, Adrian, did your uh, partner want to know where you're going to put all that telescope equipment? And, <laughs> Did, did you take over the, the dining room or the living room? Uh, yeah. So, so you, of course we need more telescopes, right? There, there's, no, there's, no one, there's no one telescope that's good at everything, right? So you have to have all the different types. And <laughs> so, 
So it, some people actually say that, that there are some telescopes that are better than others um, for double star observing. And I say, it doesn't matter. Run what you brought. Um, all telescopes will work for viewing um, double stars. Um, and if you don't have a telescope, don't think you have to rush out and buy one to look at double stars. There's a couple dozen double stars that you can see with your naked eye. If you have binoculars, um, regular 7x50 binoculars, you can increase the number of stars that you can see to something like 100,000 stars. And a good portion of those are double or multi-star systems. So as soon as you have binoculars, you're now getting into the hundreds of candidates. And if you have a telescope, and an eyepiece or two, and it can be a small telescope, you're now getting into the thousands um, of double stars that you can see. If you read the opening paragraph in the Observer's Handbook, um, it says that approximately 85% of stars are doubles or multi-star systems. So when you look at all the stars that you can see in the night sky with your eye, they look like singles in most cases, but then as soon as you put some power or amplification on it, they're multi-star systems, um, and many of those are binary systems. So again, it doesn't matter what equipment that you have. Um, if you do have a telescope, though, and you've got a few eyepieces, that is great. You're in a, a, a good uh, position to look at double stars at different magnifications. And a lot of people will say you, don't, you shouldn't use magnifications that go beyond about two or 300 power with your telescope because the atmosphere won't allow that. You can break that rule when you're doing double star observing. I've used 500 power and 600 power in some cases to try and identify where a one of those faint companion is. And then I'll drop the power back down when I know where it is, and sometimes I've been able to easily see uh, a companion. So you get to use all your dusty old eyepieces um, that you didn't think you could use. So use all magnifications, use all the equipment that you've got. Um, so, so that's kind of fun. Uh, over time, your living room will look like this. <laughs> the, uh, an, a neat thing about um, double star observing, and, and Andy also knows this with his variable star observing, that you can do this any time. Because we're talking about stars, so that means we're talking about point sources, and that means the that beam of photons can punch through light pollution and mediocre sky conditions. You don't need perfect skies, and you don't need to drive for two or three hours um, to get in the country, and you don't have to wait for a new moon phase. You can do double star observing anytime you want. Ideally, in a perfect world, you want good seeing. You want stable air um, to be able to split very tight um, double stars, but I don't sit around and wait for that. If I have a clear night, or ideally a couple of clear nights, I want to get out and do some double star observing, even if the moon's out. Um, uh, you know, I just love the moon. Um, so, so uh, when there's new moon phases, when there's no moonlight around, I look at a combination of objects, a lot of deep sky objects, and I'll have a couple of double stars. Um, for that evening campaign. But when the moon's out, I'll be looking almost exclusively at double stars. Where can you observe? Anywhere. Um, you can observe in your backyard. You can observe on your balcony um, double stars. You can observe in the city. Um, so that's, that's cool. Um, anywhere, anytime. Um, so double star observing, again, is very accommodating. It's very flexible. If you are observing um, in the backyard, um, or uh, again from your balcony, just watch out for bad seeing induced by rooftops. Um, the building, especially in the summertime, will absorb a lot of heat on their roofs, and you'll get sort of artificial bad seeing. Uh, the air will wa really waver there, but but um, regardless, you can you can observe in any location. So that's cool. Now, if you're looking for some source material. As I mentioned, the Observer's Handbook has a couple of tables in it. Um, the first table that's noteworthy is the double and multi-star um, table, and it has over 135 entries in it. And uh, if you look closely at that table, you'll notice that there are year columns 
the current year and next year, the previous year, I forget which way it goes, but there's two years noted. And what they're referring to are binary systems where the star, one of the stars is moving. So you can see in that table how binary systems are dynamically changing um, over a short period of time. There's another list in the Observer's Handbook, and it's eye candy. It's the color, a collection of 100 um, colorful double stars. And there's also a supplement list um, that's available on the RASC website um, for that. So those, there's a bunch of targets that you could go after um, if you want. Um, the magazines, of course, they have uh, often articles about um, double stars. Um, all the magazines generally talk about this. Um, Sky and Telescope, though, is clearly a big fan of double, double star observing. Um, they regularly have articles. Um, they have a lot of material on their website, stuff about getting started. They have some lists that you could use um, as checklists, um, including one for summer and one for winter. Uh, so it's, it's quite neat. And I just recently looked back through the Sky and Telescope um, index or catalog of all of their issues, all their articles, and I found articles going back to 1956 um, that are on double stars. Um, they regularly talk about this. So lots of resources there. And I was very honored when they wanted to include one of my photographs in uh, the August uh, 2017 issue of Sky and Telescope. That there was an article about double stars visible with binoculars in Draco. Um, so, so again, a lot of times they feature stuff by constellation. So that's cool. Um, the, um, the evening sky map, you familiar with this? Have you seen this? This is a, this free downloadable, free for personal and public use, um, uh, downloadable sky chart that has the monthly um, uh, sky map, um, a calendar of upcoming events, but it's the page two that I wanted to draw your attention. They have um, targets broken down by equipment. Eyeball, Mark one eyeball. Um, binoculars um, and telescope. In the binocular and telescope list, number of double stars are in that. So that's monthly oriented. That's very nice. Um, so check check that out. Um, lots of good uh, items there. I mentioned the Astronomical League, and they have certificates that you can pursue. They have a binocular program. Their basic binocular program has 120 suggestions, and you only need to report on 50 minimum. Um, they have an advanced binocular program um, for double stars. Again, there's 100 choices. You only need to report on 50. Um, so you can get certificates with uh, AL on um, binocular double star observing. They have a telescopic observing program. It has 100 suggestions on it. You have to report on all of those. Now, a little heads up with the Astronomical League um, program. Um, you need to include with your log notes that you submit, you need to include a sketch of each subject. Now that'll make some people nervous right away. Oh, I don't want to sketch things um, here. But arguably, the sketch that you would do for a double star is the easiest type of drawing. Get out your pencil and do two dots. Done. <laughs> There's your double star. There's a quick sketch that I did of 36 Ophiuchi. And the double star proper, you can see, is the two stars close together, um, just up and right of center. So it's easy to do double star sketches um, as well. And my, mine's quite crude there. Uh, if you're referring to atlases, you will often find there are circles that have a stick. It looks like a lollipop, or there's little Saturn images everywhere. Um, that uh, circle with the stroke through it is an indication of a um, uh, a telescopic uh, double star. See, there's one there, there's one there, um, there's one over there. You see those little icons? So that's an indication that when you put your telescope on that particular object, you're going to see two stars very close together. Um, over here is Zeta 1 and Zeta 2 in Scorpius. Um, and you can see there's individual circles for that. So that's a wide double star that they're showing there. So your atlases will generally show double stars by using some sort of convention um, like that. That's from the Cambridge Atlas of uh, du Double Stars. Uh, it's a very nice, very nice book. You can have a look at that if you'd like. Um, 
So classic, you know, chart atlas thing. And then there's lists of double stars um, uh, in the latter part of that book. And perhaps the most famous book on double stars is Sissy Haas's um, Double Stars for Smallest Telescopes. And this has over uh, 2,000 entries in it. And you can view all of these with a three or four inch scope. Um, they're all under, all those subjects are under um, magnitude eight. Um, so e easily done. Um, you'll find my book is very dog-eared, lots of quest, uh, check marks and some notes um, in it. So I'm still working through that. I'm at about 1,200 viewed double stars um, now. Uh, software, of course, if you use software and you look at a double star, um, it might just seem as one blob and then you zoom in and it splits apart. Two stars come apart. So you'll see that in Stellarium, you'll see that on Sky Safari. Um, the snapshot of, that I'm showing here is from Sky Tools, and, and when there's known orbital information about a binary system, it can actually plot the orbit and show you the dates um, where the, you can expect to find a star at a particular point in time. So that can be helpful. You can see that that B star of HD 102476 is drawing closer to the A star. So it's going to get harder and harder to see um, over time. Um, you can see that software is simulating the colors there as well. Uh, Astro Planner, um, a competitor to Sky Tools, has similar sort of plots. So a lot of software can help you track down double stars pretty easily. Um, just wanted to briefly mention the designations that are used um, for double stars. You've seen some of them already. A famous double star observer from the 1800s, Frederick Struve, um, his double star catalog has many entries in it, and they're often shown with the uppercase Greek sigma characters. So you'll see sigma followed by some numbers, and that's a particular uh, double star. Um, a three-letter code is also used, uh, STF. Um, but Struve double stars, there's lots of those that you can look at. Uh, family member, Otto Struve, um, you can see the O with the sigma is used, or STT for that. So there's lots of catalogs. I won't go through all of them there. But I do want to draw your attention to Burnham. Burnham's double star catalog um, uses beta. And that's not to be confused with the beta star of a constellation. So if you see beta Cephei, that's the, presumably the second brightest star in Cepheus. But beta followed by some numbers is a double star from the Burnham catalog. So watch out for that. It's a bit confusing at first glance when you see the beta being used. So lots of designations are used for these. Uh, I've been suggesting that if you look at double stars, that you keep some notes about them. I encourage you to add them to your observing programs. And your note, I don't know if you can read those notes, but, but uh, there's remarks about the color and how close or tight the stars are. And you can see the person did a little sketch. See, how, how hard can that be? Um, so nice little sketches there for all those, those double stars with a date and time. And remember to note the equipment that you used, what eyepiece you used, or if you use more than one eyepiece, what your view was like in each one of those. It may be quite different. Um, the colors may change from eyepiece to eyepiece. Uh, and um, and, and uh, note your sky conditions and so on. Try to assess the seeing conditions that may be a factor. Um, if you want to note the positions of stars, there's a formal way that you can do that, but if you're just starting out, just maybe use a clock face, um, that the B component was at the 3 o'clock position. Uh, that, that's perfectly fine. Um, so maybe uh, start adding, again, double stars to your observing sessions and keeping some notes about them. Uh, again, you don't have to split these double stars, so there might be ones that you want to return to. So again, keeping good log notes about that, that you couldn't split it before, but then you've successfully done it on a later visit, that, that'll be good. I've given you some su suggestions for double stars already, but here's a, a few more, another dozen. There, all my notes, by the way, are on our website, um, so you'll find that suggestion list there. And the images that are here are of a couple of these subjects. The top left one here, that's Mizar and Alcor. You may know or be familiar with that multi-star system. That's kind of cool because it's one you can see with your naked eye. Most people can see a star blob with their naked eye and then a very faint one near it 
with just their eye. They're very close together with, with your naked eye. But you put binoculars on it, and the Alcor star moves away from Mizar. You put powerful binoculars or a low power telescope on it, and Mizar breaks into two stars. So that were, that's a very rewarding multi-star system. It works well at low power, medium power, high power. It's fun to look at. Um, can you see it? See it? Can you make it out? Can you make out the teeny weeny fate companion to Sulafat? So I took that image with my DSLR, um, and there's that faint secondary star. It's almost impossible um, to see that. You can't, you can't see it with your eye, but it shows up nicely in a photograph um, there. So the, again, that shows you a very unequal um, pair of stars in terms of brightness. And speaking of unequal, this is um, T. Draconis. Look at those colors, just fantastic. Um, so that's, again, taken with a DSLR. Um, so one-shot color, that's going to be pretty similar to what you see with your eye. Um, so uh, the last star that I have on the list here, 70 Ophiuchi, um, that's one of those fast movers. So that's a double star that has an 88-year period. Um, so every year that you go back to it and look at it, it's going to be in a slightly different position or they're drawing close together or coming apart. Um, so lots of suggestions there for your consideration. Those are some fairly easy ones. Um, you excited? Interested? Um, so if you don't regularly look at double stars, I encourage you to do that. I, I think they're fun. They're, they're beautiful. It, they're dynamic. That's another thing about these, that some of them are fixed and static, but some of them are moving. So that's a fun thing about celestial objects. Um, here. So again, consider adding them to your observing list. If you want more lists, I can give you other suggestions um, by location, by, by uh, time of year. Um, uh, keep your log notes up to date with details of the particularly ones that you can't split so you can go back to them and see if you can improve on that. Um, I'm often up at the CAO in the summer. If you want to look at some double stars together, I'm happy to share the view or we can chase after some uh, some challenging or interesting targets. Um, so I'm happy to help you if you have any questions about, about that. Uh, again, I'm trying to sort of raise awareness a bit here with double stars. Um, there's stuff that we could do in the future if there's interest. Um, I can do more talks. I can talk about how to measure double stars. I can talk about how you could um, compile reports and submit them to the Washington Double Star Database. Um, I can share with you some of my adventures with respect to photographing um, double, double stars. And I'm even kicking around the idea of a workshop, a bit like variable star workshops, um, where we do a bit of theory and some discussions in the day, and then we can do some nighttime observing and put it all into practice. So food for thought. Um, the, if your smartphone has a, a QR code reader, um, that'll take you directly to the uh, web page where I have all these materials and some of those photographs. Um, you can go to raskto.ca um, and do a search for uh, the word double or double star and you'll find the article um, there. And um, I'm tooting my own horn there. If you want to visit my blog, you'll see lots of double star photographs and my life list with, again, uh, uh, just over a thousand entries on that. Um, so thanks for your time. So any questions for me on double star uh, observing? I'll wait for the microphone to move around. Chris. First of all, big thumbs up for the Cambridge Double Star Atlas. It's nice big charts. They're organized with the para-facing charts in the adjacent sky. Mm -hmm. And they've got all the deep sky objects as well. So it's a nice alternative to the pocket sky atlas for, yeah. older, for older eyes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And the, these charts are by uh, Will Tyrion, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, he did the Sky Atlas 2000 and so on. They're just lovely charts to look at, yeah. Yeah, I love the size. Yeah. Can you comment on um, procedures for reobserving and updating log reports briefly? So would you update a previous log of a observation would you no. or do you have to put a reference to cross-reference it back that kind of thing so uh, my 
logging is done online. I just use Blogger. It's, it's my logbook. That's what I use to keep all my um, observing information. So that's date-based. Um, so that's not unlike what we would do with a paper log, right? That, that um, we record the date, the event, the details, the telescope, the sky condition, and so on. Then I have a life list, but I point that to the individual entries. And, and I have kind of a hi hi historical reference in my life list where I'll say, could not split it on this date. And then the next sentence is, I split it successfully on this date with this telescope. So I, I quickly summarize it in my life list, but I go, I have linking that goes right back to my original log note with all the gory details. Um, so my life list, I have quick notes about sort of what happened historically for things that I needed to revisit. I haven't done that well. I didn't do it well in initially, but I, I'm correcting old log notes that are confusing. Um, there's some that I go back and reread, and I go, oh, what? what was I doing? I can't figure it out. Um, so, so some of those notes I have to really sort of tidy up, but that's, that's how I do it. Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, my first visit to a telescope shop was Perceptor in Schomburg, mm -hmm. and I got there and I had to wait because John and Suzanne were helping somebody else. And then this other guy came and we got chatting and I said, well, this is my first time to a telescope shop. And I said, uh, you know, we chatted a bit and I said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm making a deposit on a 16 inch telescope. And he had something like 7,000 in cash for his deposit. And anyway, uh, George Armstrong and he lived somewhere near Owen Sound. I don't know if anybody knows of him. Um, he did double star work and he would observe stars that had been observed a hundred years ago and measure the exact angle compared to north and the separation and he said that would link together with the previous observations and they could find huge amounts of information about the stars mm. and uh, I just wanted to share that because uh, it kind of made me in awe of what some people are doing in astronomy. So thanks Ron, the, that's um Something that I'm sort of hinting at, maybe in this presentation, but didn't want to get into in a lot of lot of detail. Um, but but uh, that that is something very interesting to me about double star observing. That like what Andy talked about with variable star observing, um, all of us can do citizen science very easily in our backyard. So viewing double stars, particularly binaries, and how they move, um, and measuring that with some accuracy, and then submitting that data, is contributing to a body of knowledge. That, that data is managed by um, the US Naval Observatory, um, and the Washington Double Star Database is the master list of double star observations. And when we measure, um, a binary system and how the elements are moving over time um, and we get a reasonable amount of data so that we can calculate the orbit then when we do that we can calculate the mass of those stars and like variable star observing that's very important data um, that has a cascading effect it helps us with uh, the cosmic ladder measurements of stars in our galaxy and other galaxies and so on um, so so that's a higher level of working with double stars, but that's that's something that I'm moving into. Um, I'm I've done a number of measurement campaigns. I'm refining my methods. Um, there's ways that you can do it visually. Um, I'm trying to to have repeatable, measurable data, so I'm doing a lot of this photographically. Um, but but you can also do armchair double star astronomy in that you can look at existing catalogs, say with Sinbad and Aladdin, and look at historical photographs, and then plot the position of those stars and how they're changing over time. So it's very easy to do. You don't even have to shoot the photos um, if you don't want. So that's something that I'm interested in. If, if other people are interested in that, we can sort of kick it up a notch and look at measurement methods um, and maybe photographing them and then submitting that, that data for peer review. Um, a group, um, based in the US, the Journal of Double Star Observers, um, uh, the JDSO, is one of the, one of the places uh, as a clearinghouse for papers um, where, where you can submit your findings. 
Um, lots of uh, students do this too, uh, that you might be interested in. There's a lot of um, high school projects where they spend a weekend measuring a couple hundred devil stars, and they, then they, at the end, they submit a paper on that. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Adrian. What's your normal process uh, on an even, on a, on a given evening? Like, do you sit there be ahead of time and decide what you're going to look for, or you just go outside and just whatever's in the sky at the time? So, so some of you know that I'm a big fan of um, uh, the Sky Tool software. Admittedly, um, <laughs> a very big fan um, of that. But, but that's uh, astronomy planning software, and I have to do that. I have to do planning for my sessions. Um, uh, early on, I caught myself just looking at the same objects over and over again, and then at the end of the evening, I was going, well, I didn't see anything new and exciting. Um, so for me, I uh, build up a list of things that I want to look at. And some of those are things that I've heard of, maybe from a magazine. Um, there might be some targets, like a double star, that I want to revisit because I didn't split it um, before. And Sky Tools has the ability to also generate a list of targets for me automatically based on my date, time, location, um, and the equipment that I'm going to be using. So I have a hybrid approach that I'll build an observing list. Say, say I'm heading up to the car observatory next weekend. I'll build a list a couple of days before and add things to that. Some of them I'll add manually. Some of them I'll copy from old lists. And some of it will be automatically generated. And then that gives me a list of targets. And again, I already told you that if it's going to be a bright moon on that weekend, it's going to be mostly double star targets that I'll have in that list. And when it's a new moon weekend, um, it's going to be a lot of deep sky stuff, galaxies and so on, and the odd quasar, um, and, and then a few double stars that I'm trying to, you know, finally nail them. <laughs> so that's, a, again, it's a hybrid approach, but I, I'm using planning software. So Sky Tools, Astro Planner, are some of the popular tools for doing that. They can do automatic list generation, and they can accept data from other sources manually and put if necessary. Yeah. Other questions? Do I see a question over there? Andy, sorry, you got the mic, yeah? Yeah, sorry, let, let me make amends for my uh, my previous presentation. I didn't yeah, include I, a double I star. I should hope so. <laughs> so <laughs> let me suggest uh, 12 <laughs> links, which I was looking at last uh, weekend. Uh, it's a nice, Binoc a nice telescope double star, but if you've got uh, if you've got the eyes for it, one of the stars is a very close double itself. I think uh, under two arc seconds apart, so mm -hmm. it's a, a nice easy object and a nice difficult object all together mm. in one. Uh, so that was twelve lynxes, did you? Twelve lynxes, yes. Yeah, um, I can't remember off the top of my head if I've looked at that, but but that's a neat thing about multi-star systems is that sometimes you'll you'll see a nice wide pair, very colorful and so on, and then then you go, wait a minute, there's something beside the, the A star. What's that? Um, so sometimes you'll discover or, or see other stars in the field. Um, a lot of times when I'm imaging stars, I'll see faint stars in the background, and they may not be listed in my software. But then I'll go look up from the Washington Double Star Database what, what's the official list of all the candidates in that system. And sometimes I've found or identified other members in a multi-star system that that were very faint um, or very close to the to the primary. Yeah, it is in the uh, list in the handbook, so okay. everyone should be able to find it. Yeah, good. Um, so there's a lot of systems like that. They work great at low power, and then you get a treat when you get good steady air, um, and you you use higher magnification. And again, if you have a telescope and a boatload of eyepieces, you get to use them all. View, view, view double stars at low power, view them at high power. And when I'm sitting somewhere and I didn't bring my telescope, but I've got some binoculars, I'll, I'll go look for some double stars from a, a Muskoka chair. So that, that's fun. Question at the back. What the computer for? Pa pardon me, can you repeat? What's the computer for? What's what? computer for? What's the computer for? Yeah. Well, my, my, I can't do math anymore. My brain's really bad at math, so I need a computer to help me with that. And I'm, I'm doing my presentation. Did you see all the pictures that I did? 
I, I use the computer to, to do that. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good stuff. That was a great question. <laughs> All right, thank All right, you. Thank you. Thanks. Great presentation. Thank you, Blake, for a great presentation, as always. We look forward to uh, some, uh, some of your future talks. Uh, all right, so that concludes the uh, speakers for this evening. Uh, I'll call on our president, Ralph Chu, to uh, take care of the announcements for tonight. Okay, well, just to finish off, uh, what's coming up uh, in the center over the next uh, couple of weeks? So let's just take a look at uh, what's on uh, the agenda. Our next meeting in two weeks' time is a speaker's night, uh, and our guest is going to be uh, Catherine Woodford, who's uh, doing her PhD stu studies at the University of Toronto. And uh, she's working out of the Department of Physics in the Canadian uh, uh, Center for uh, Theoret uh, Institute for uh, Theoretical Astrophysics. And she'll be talking about gravitational waves, the sirens of the universe. So uh, hopefully we'll get a bit of an update on what's been going on with observing gravitational waves uh, and uh, where they're coming from. Two weeks after that, on March 21st, we have our next Recreational Astronomy Night meeting. And uh, for that meeting, we have Michael Watson uh, presenting the sky this month, uh, Chris Vaughn uh, making Le Monde, <laughs> tips, tricks, and targets for observing the full moon. I looked at that, and uh, originally, I looked at that, and I thought, making lemonade? <laughs> yeah. Nice play on the word. Anyway, look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say about that. And uh, apparently, we do still have one more empty slot? Yeah, right. Cool. Yeah. OK, so if anybody wants to uh, come up here and do a presentation that evening, please talk to Paul Markov about that. And I'm sure he'll be very happy to uh, uh, put you into the uh, uh, program. OK, observing. Our next observing session uh, is scheduled for this Saturday uh, from 10 o'clock till noon on the telescope here at the Science Center. Unfortunately, the long-range forecast doesn't look very good for this week. And if that's the case, then we'll probably have to look at uh, going for the following weekend instead. But in any case, uh, we have Sean, who will be uh, making the go or no-go uh, call on that. So. Uh, 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 again, we'll uh, hear from you one way or another, either Friday evening or Saturday morning. Okay, and uh, again, the go-no-go no go calls are on the Yahoo list as well as the forum uh, and uh, Twitter and Facebook. Okay, other observing programs. Again, uh, this week is supposed to be the uh, uh, City Star Party and uh, at this point, when I got in here this evening, just before 7.30, the clouds were breaking up. Uh, certainly out on the west end, it was clear. But there was a bit of cloud on the horizon. So again, uh, the forecast for tomorrow night is uh, sort of iffy. And uh, yeah, right. So Peter is going to make the call about 5 o'clock uh, for a go or no go, and we'll see what happens. But in any case, uh, uh, for March, we have the Dark Sky Star Party uh, tentatively at Long Sioux Conservation Area, first clear night on the week of the 12th to the 15th of March. Uh, and I guess you're still looking at whether you're going to go there or uh, somewhere closer in? Or have you sort of made a decision? Okay. 
Well, we'll get a confirmation anyway. We'll you know, give us the go, no go. Uh, star, uh, City Star Party uh, will be uh, the week, first clear night of uh, 19th through 22nd, with the exception that, of course, the Wednesday night is uh, meeting night. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of cl uh, clear sky in March. Okay. Uh, Talking about the uh, media, I've been advised that uh, the people who are ringing it right now, uh, uh, we have uh, Katrina uh, Inslum, who has been uh, uh, doing our Twitter feeds, and uh, Charmaine uh, uh, Cowdery, who's been uh, uh, working on Facebook. Both of them are in need of some backup, and uh, certainly if you're uh, able to help out with that, it would be greatly appreciated. Not a great deal of work uh, involved with either one of them, but uh, we do have active Twitter and Facebook accounts, and uh, uh, both ladies could certainly use some help in running those uh, and giving them a bit of relief uh, so they can go on and do a few other things as well. Uh, there's been mention about our dark sky site uh, up near uh, Collingwood, the EC Carr Astronomical Observatory. And uh, again, a reminder that it is one of the benefits of membership that we do have this property on the west end of Blue Mountain and that uh, it is operational all year around, although at this time of the year uh, the road is not maintained and uh, the last couple of uh, uh, parties that went to visit, uh, we had them take a look at the road enter, uh, coming up into the property, and uh, we know already that come the spring, this, uh, the town is going to have to do a major regrading of the road. Uh, there's a uh, roughly two foot deep cut across the, uh, the road uh, due to the runoff from the winter snow, uh, from the melt, so uh, for the, for at least a, a little while, uh, we definitely will not be able to use the road to get in there. That means you have to park at the top of the hill and walk down a fairly steep incline and bring in your food and your equipment if you want to bring equipment and everything else that you need for your stay. Uh, but again, it is available if you wish to use the place and you can book your uh, uh, time online on the website. Uh, also, a reminder that we do have um, a number of instruments that are available for loan uh, to members. And uh, we have, uh, I see two of our uh, telescope loan program managers here, uh, Peter and George. So uh, if anybody's interested in that, please talk to those gentlemen about um, uh, looking at borrowing some of that equipment. And finally, uh, the meeting after the meeting, uh, we do repair to the Granite Brew Pub uh, down at Mount Pleasant and uh, Eglinton Avenue. Uh, please remember that uh, there are no turns from Eglinton on to Mount Pleasant uh, in any direction, and so you do have to come in from, you, from uh, the south on Mount Pleasant to get into the parking garage. Uh, it, is, it is available and uh, accessible. Uh, but again, just have to be careful with driving up in that area because of the construction for the uh, LRT. So anyway, that's it for tonight. Uh, so thank you very much for coming out, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night, everyone.